So I was thinking about, you know, I wrote some notes and I go back and forth and I tend to want to get closer to the audience <laughs> instead of stand behind here. Um, I was thinking about, you know, I never, like, oh God, yeah, so my PhD is in geography, which is a social science. If anybody, I don't call myself a social scientist ever. I actually don't call myself an academic and I'm not in, I left full-time academia for a lot of the reasons that we're all here to discuss. Um, um, the thing, when I think about data, I was thinking about this, you know, data is information. And so part of what I want to ask you this morning is to say, yeah, there's some things I'm going to say. I'm going to weave some stories together. It's going to be both personal as well as historical, just to kind of give us a sense. But the thing about diversity, I'm sorry, you, nothing's going to change if you're simply taking this in as information. You can't do it. It has to also be personal. It should be personal for everyone. And that's really what makes it hard. That's the tension to understand. We all know that data has impact. We can talk about it up here, but I also need you to understand it right here, right? And, that, and that's partly what I'm going to get at today a little bit, um, and recognizing the challenges of that. Um, I was thinking about, here's what I wrote. I said, um, well, has anybody seen that movie this week? I came out this past week on the event um, called The Inventor. Oh, man. Oh, you have to see it about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. That does you know, some crazy mess. Um, but that's not what I, I don't want to talk about her. But there was a scientist on here, uh, and it was something that he said. Um, it was something that he said about um, data, and I'm, I wrote it down here because I want to sort of get it right. What I what I heard him say. I wrote it here at the end. I wrote it here somewhere. I did. Um, one of the scientists talked about data, saying that data provides information, but it's the story that pulls people in and gets them to change. And you know, we know that. I'm sure all of you know that. This is kind of what you do. But sometimes I think we forget what that means because we think of the story as being kind of qualitative. We think of the story as being, oh, just that woo-woo thing that we can kind of connect. And for me, the story is everything. It's actually what brings life to the data. Um, when I wrote, so. So, you know, going back to school and stuff was a second career for me. And when I started the PhD in the early 2000s, and because of reasons that I could not control, because I was originally doing work on gender and environment in Nepal, and there was political unrest, and I couldn't do that. So then I decided I was going to do race and, and my allergies are acting up, man. So I apologize for that. Um, I was going to do stuff on African Americans. So this was 2002, 2003. And I remember going to the library to see what data and information I could find on African Americans in the environment, and I found almost nothing. Right? There was a little bit there around environmental justice, and environmental justice is incredibly important, and environmental justice tends to emphasize the bad things done to good people. They, they tend to emphasize the vulnerability. And the thing is about black people and any group, we're not just the bad things that happen to us. So all the other ways that we kind of show up, that we're resilient, creative, do the work that we do, there was nothing on the library shelves. There was no data there. Um, so I wrote, does this mean, so I, so I was asking the question, I found so little, so does this mean that we don't care? Does it mean that black people don't have, have nothing to offer? Um, or does it mean that we just don't matter? I mean, what's going on there, which has always been personal for me. Um, so I found that when I was doing this work, it wasn't simply about, interviewing black people and looking theoretically at things and taking history and pulling it in. I actually, it was also about how this work is done, how data is collected, what information is considered valuable, who's actually collecting that information, um, who's deciding, because um, Alicia, you had some great things up there, I was saying, like, how do you even get promoted on that information, the way that information is framed, what's considered theory, and it goes on and on and on, what's adopted into policy, who gets to adopt it into policy, because who's in that space, and we don't know what we don't know, so how does that work, and privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself, and how does that work as well, when you can have, this isn't about being good people and bad people, because we often get hung up on that conversation around diversity, you know, you're good if you do these things, and you're not good if you don't. Actually, we're all way more complicated than that, right? And, and again, I think we don't know what we don't know, and how do we hold that? So I want to, you know, um, yes, and I wanted to put this up here. Too. Don't you love her? I love her. I love her too. She's fabulous. When I got a chance to meet her, and I was like, what? Um, 
So for those of you who don't know, Bernice Reagan Johnson, who founded, was one of the founding members of Sweet Honey in the Rock, which is an amazing a cappella group. But this was probably maybe seven years ago now. Uh, at the University of Minnesota, they had a conference called Black Environmental Thought II. And I was like, I never knew there was a Black Environmental Thought I. What, like, what's happening? <laughs> but it was fabulous, and she was the keynote. And she started off talking, she wasn't even, at, didn't understand why she was asked to be a keynote on environmental thought, but she found a way to do it. She sang half of her keynote. It was like, what's happening right now? Um, <laughs> but one of the many things she said that stuck with me, and she was looking out at an audience of um, professors, of artists, of students, and she said that she was talking very particularly about African Americans, but I think this could be applied across groups. She said, you have to go below the intellectual paper record to get that story. She said, she was saying to get that black story, but actually, <laughs> I think it's to get really any story, a better understanding of who somebody is. And the challenge is to be able, being able to do that um, and why it's so challenging. The other thing is, and those of you, um, you know, this, I can't have this conversation with you about this without it being personal. You know, I joke around and said, I just can't be incognito, it just doesn't work for me. <laughs> so, and, and again, I started off by saying it should be personal for everyone, but it's definitely personal for me. You know, we're all biased. I'm biased, too. So the first thing I have to do is situate um, for you, myself, in, in a bit of my own personal story, why I come to think about the environment in this particular way, why I come to think about story in a particular way, why I come to think about data in a very particular way. Um, and this was going on when I was doing, it was personal because this happened around 2003 with my family. At the same time, I was starting to do this work and think, I want to you know, find out some more information about black people in the environment and be able to talk about it in a particular way. So, and some of you may have heard me tell this story before. I apologize, because it's still the same story, but <laughs> it's my story, right? Um, so people always, earlier, um, a gentleman, he asked, we had the door, he said he wanted to know where I'm from. And I said, um, well, I said to him, I said, I'm gonna tell you that story in a minute. But oftentimes, you see how I'm moving? I know, sorry. I can't help it, I wanna be close. No, that's okay. I'll just try to be disciplined. <laughs> um, people often ask me where I'm from, and I've moved around a lot, but sometimes I'll get a little attitude, and I'll say, like, you want to know where I live? Or do you want to know where I'm from? Like, all in the attitude. <laughs> and about maybe it's probably been about five years ago, I was in Detroit. I was at a street fair there, and an older black man said to me, where are you from? And I said, do you want to know where I live? Or do you want to know where I'm from? And he just looked at me like this. You must be from New York. while she was under anesthesia, they just removed one of her ovaries. They told her afterwards, the reason we didn't tell you about it, because we didn't think you could emotionally handle the information. Yes. Um, uh, so they didn't think they could have kids, and actually that benefited me because they adopted me. And then what I like to say, they're really going to take me. Nice person. 
Okay, excellent. Um, oh yeah, I can hear it now. Uh, it, yes, it benefited me, right, because they adopted me. And then what I like to say is they relaxed and had my first brother, and they relaxed some more and had my second brother. <laughs> and so that's us in this very, this was a very wealthy, all white neighborhood except for us. We were the only family of color in this neighborhood until the early 90s when a Japanese American woman moved in. She was there for a few years and then she moved out. The story that I generally tell, and it's this, we were, we were outside all the time. We all knew how to swim by the time we were six or seven years old. It was a stunning piece of land to, to and we were privileged to have access to it. I also want to say, in terms of wealth, Harry Winston had property down the street. Wingfoot Golf Club is around the corner. Um, Schaefer of Schaefer Beer. You older folks will remember Schaefer, but terrible beer, terrible. <laughs> Live next door. So you get the you know, kind of money that's in the neighborhood. You always had police patrolling the neighborhood because you had the kind of wealth, that kind of wealth in this neighborhood. So the story that I always tell audiences to say so. I was nine years old, I'm, we went to public school, my married at public school, I was walking home from school one day, I was looking very unimpressive, I had a little afro and a little school bag, my little reading glasses. I was around the corner from the house, a cop stopped me, he wanted to know where I was going, I said a thousand old White Plains Road, which is the address, and he just looked at me and said, oh, do you work there? I'm thinking, dude, I'm nine, <laughs> but I can't say anything like that, I was just confused, I said, no, I live there. And I go home, I tell my father, who called up the police station and gave him holy hell, basically, and they never bothered me and my brothers again. But as an adult, I have to think about the logics there, right? And this is a conversation we're hearing all the time, if we're paying attention out there, about the logics. A little girl, mid-afternoon, school bag, all the things that were there that you should, maybe he should have stopped today. Are you okay where you're going? Can I help you get home? But instead could only imagine me in this beautiful place um, if I work there. I want to jump ahead now to um, the 90s. So now my parents have been on this land for 40 years. They've been caring for it full time. The Tishmans come up on weekends and holidays. They've got other properties and places they can go. Uh, Mr. Tishman had died quite a, a while, years earlier. But Mrs. Tishman is now sick. And she knows that she's going to die. And what's going to happen to my parents? They've been on this land for that long. To her credit, she wanted to try to keep them on this land. This land was worth over $3 million in the 90s. The property taxes were over $125,000 a year. My dad had been making about $20,000 a year. Um, they had a complicated relationship. It was paternal in many ways. Um, but she also had my father by her bedside when she died. Um, so her children, it was complicated. Her grown children, no, my, we couldn't stay on the property. Let me just leave it like that. Um, and so in the end, she had a house built for them in Leesburg, Virginia. Now, my father swore he was never going back to the state of Virginia, but at that point, my youngest brother was married with kids, and he was sort of settled, and me and my other brother were moving around too much. So they have a beautiful house. So Mrs. Tishman passed away. My parents stayed on until 2003. A new owner came on, but they couldn't leave. So now they're in their late 70s, so now they've been on the land almost 50 years, right? And they need a new family to move in. They find a family from the Dominican Republic that's now going to take this job. When they leave, the house is beautiful. They live on a half an acre of land. My dad, in particular, got very depressed. And he, all he was talking about was the land, right? And missing the land and feeling like this was home. This was right when I started doing this work on African American environment, trying to find information about that. And thinking about how in this country, when we're talking about the environment and land, we largely frame it in two ways. Why don't we talk about it in terms of recreation? The other is, it's the natural resources. They're natural resources for us to use. But for me, we don't look at labor and work as another way to build that relationship, as a way to contribute, as a way to be creative and resilient, and to love the land and love the environment. My parents would never call themselves environmentalists, ever. You say that to them, they're just going to look at you. Funny. Um, but that doesn't mean that they weren't engaged and didn't care, right? And, and, and I started to think about all the people in this country who have had the same experience but are largely invisible in the data, they're largely invisible in the conversation, which means then they're largely invisible in the policy, the legislation, the curriculum and the universities, and it just rolls itself down the hill because everybody becomes invisible. Not everybody, but significant groups of people become invisible in that story. Um, the last thing I want to say about that is that in about 2003, 2004, my parents received a letter, a copy of a letter from one of the neighbors because the Westchester Conservation Land Trust had decided to put a conservation easement on this piece of land. 
and they had sent a letter out to everyone to say, here's all the environmental reasons why we're doing it, where it sits in the watershed, the wildlife on the property, all these reasons why it needs to be protected, which means in perpetuity, nothing can be changed on this property. At the end of the letter, it thanked the new owner for his conservation-mindedness, right? He'd been on there for about three years at that point. There was nothing in the letter thanking my parents who'd cared for that land for 50. So just like that, gone, right? I'm sure the people at the Westchester Conservation Land Trust are good people. I'm sure they're nice people, actually, and well-intentioned. I mean, you know, why wouldn't they be? And yet the power just to not see my family and gone, and that happens over and over. So you can then go collect data, and unless you know how to look for something different, why would you even look you know, behind the shadow, behind that existing data to see what else might be there that we're not talking about? Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's the big house. You can see the blue in front. Um, so, yeah, ooh, I lost my way there, but not really. So let's put it a different way. I wrote here, um, what did I write here? I said, how do we, uh, just because there was nothing on the shelves didn't mean black folks weren't producing knowledge about ourselves. That's the other thing. When you have historically not been allowed to participate in traditional spaces of knowledge production, so you know, one of those questions I saw up there that Alicia had on her slide, you know, thinking one of the things that, reasons why we may not see people there because actually, historically, if you've never been invited in, why would you trust people in that space now? Because again, it's not just intellectual, it's not just professional, it's personal. Do people actually see your difference? The thing, one of the hardest things for me to take is when somebody looks at me and says, I don't see your color. You're just like me. I understand, you, I know people are laughing because you know what that thing is. And I know in their hearts, because I'm an empathetic and compassionate and optimistic human being, <laughs> that what they're trying to say is, you're human, you're, you are human like me. But what they're also doing is invalidating my history, my experience, and my presence, which means I can't trust you. Which doesn't mean I don't think you're a good person. It just means I can't trust you. And so now you're gonna invite me in to work with you as the only one. How am I supposed to trust you? Because I know how nice you are and we can go get drinks and I know we're gonna have some good laughs. But this means that you can't see who I am and imagine my experience, which means you can't be my ally, which means you can't support me, which means you won't even know when you need to be able to do that because privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself. And again, you can't see me. So for me, how do we change that? How do we have that conversation? And I said it earlier, everybody has bias. So I always put these two stories up here because an example how my bias, everyone is biased and we can have a conversation because bias is not the same as prejudice, is not the same as racism. They kind of live together, <laughs> but they are not the same. And we're all biased based on we all are who we are. We're situated in our lives, we have experiences. You don't need to apologize for that. Nobody should have to apologize for their bias. But I think you have to understand what your bias is. Right, and where your blinders are on. So I usually put up these two stories. Oftentimes, you know, when groups, environmental groups, want to talk about sustainability, and I ask the question, well, what is it that we're trying to sustain? And so this story of um, Ian Gibson, this was maybe, I don't remember, maybe three, four years ago. The story that actually six months later came out in the news that people were talking about was a white dentist who goes sport hunting in South Africa and killed the, like, the grandson lion of the famous lion or something like that. But six months before him, Ian Gibson, who's also a sport hunter, went to southern Africa to hunt elephants for sport. And he was with a, a group of black and white men, African and non-African, and he got too close to a bull elephant and he got gored to death. He was about 53. And I was reading this online, right? You know, I, I, myself, I can't support sport hunting. I just have a real hard time understanding why anybody would want to do that. I love elephants. They're one of my two favorite animals, you know? So I have, there's all these reasons why I feel like I've got, no, my bias is thick around him. As I was reading the article and I was reading it online, then I did the thing where you start reading the comments. Yes. <laughs> time passes, you don't even know what's <laughs> happening. By the time I got to the end of the comments, I was in tears. I was in tears because every comment, save for one, said things like, he got what he deserved. 
one for the elephant. And it just kept going on and on and on. And I realized in my own anger and in my own bias that that felt terrible because this man died a horrible death. This man had a family. This man came from a community. And even though it seems like we have very little in common, if, if, it is, if I can't actually open my mind to considering him differently, then what is it that we're trying to sustain? Because actually, we can talk about protecting the lake, protecting the beach, protecting the forest. If we don't work on our own relationships, it doesn't matter for me how far we go, because all that's kind of surface stuff. You know, the activities we can do without doing the hard and deep and conscious shifting work of actually looking at ourselves in the mirror and then deciding our relationships are worth the risk to actually go there around these conversations of difference. I put it up here next to this little guy because actually I don't really have to do as much work over here, right? Uh, this little boy was um, part of a story on Flint, Michigan, the lead in the water over time, the impact it's gonna have on kids which they actually don't know what that's going to be. And it's, it's just easier for me not to be, I can kind of look at him, he's, He's African American, he's a little child, he didn't have any role in that, and I, 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 don't, I feel less uh, conflicted about you know, what he must be going through. This is where I have to do my work, over here, where my bias is, to try to understand, could I sit with his family and have a conversation? Um, and what will that look like, and how do I build my capacity and skill set so that I might do so? Yes. Um, in terms of data and thinking about how do you know the stories, it's for me, again, what's also behind it? And I'm always sort of putting, the, putting up some broader brush strokes of our history around any environmental conversation in this country in particular, right? So I put this up in this way, and there's a lot of things I could have put up there, but I put up everything from Japanese internment to slavery to poor people to immigrants. I mean, just putting it up there to say, like, these things have always existed in this country, always. Now, we have a conversation about environment, and often what we talk about, right, and smack in the middle there is President Roosevelt and John Muir. It's 1903. They're in Yosemite on overhanging rock. They're having this conversation about wilderness and conservation and commitment and national parks, and they're doing the whole thing. And I'm not interested in denigrating them because they had an effect on what we're, even the way that we have this conversation now, right? They've had an impact on it. Their commitment was real. I have no doubt at all about their commitment. The thing for me, what else was going on in 1903 while they were talking about using this universal language about how we all should be and what that relationship should look like, how we should manage, preserve, take care of, blah, 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 blah. Yes, it is important. Sometimes I just went blah, blah, blah. I can't even believe I did that. Um, because sometimes that's what it is. Because 1903, let's think about Jim Crow segregation, firmly in place. So if you were black and or non-white, actually, I'm sorry, it didn't matter if it was a beautiful park, it didn't matter if it was a beautiful forest, beautiful beach, you couldn't safely and securely go into those spaces. Didn't matter what they were saying, actually. Let's go back a little earlier than that. I like to go back to 1862. Back in the olden days of 1862, I never thought about the Homestead Act before doing this work. I never thought about it at all until I understand that that piece of legislation changed the way we relate to land, right? In 1862, for the most part, if you were a European immigrant, you could come over here, that gun went off at midnight, you could run out, you could put a stake down on 160 acres of land, and if you stayed on that land for five years, if you built a structure, if you farmed, and survive that, that land was yours free and clear. Folks, that can't happen anywhere, at any time, anymore. Not on this planet. We may get, think about something else on another planet, but we can't do that here anymore. And understand that land isn't just about land. It's about political and economic power, and it is about legacy, and it is about belonging. It is the right to claim your place and say, my story counts. My presence counts. This land is mine. Right? And then I have to think of, hmm, who was on that land and had to be removed so you could get it for free? The general you, right? I'm just saying. Um, all the native people who were killed and or removed. Because this land is stolen, all of it's stolen. No matter how far we get down the road, this land will always be stolen. So how do we hold that? Um, I think about three years later, Emancipation Proclamation, enslaved Africans are freed. They're given 400,000 acres of land. And then white plantation owners say, hey, whoa, we didn't just give them land, people that we held as property. We gave them economic and political power. And I do believe they're going to be pissed off. We're going to take that land back. 
And for the most part, they can't participate in the Homestead Act. Now, I'm not interested in denigrating European immigrants. Many of them died, something like 60% of them didn't make it through those five years. Many of them were leaving circumstances where they couldn't have the land and be where they wanted to be in their original home. I can only imagine, many of them died from things like the common cold or loneliness because their closest neighbor could be 100 miles away. It was hard, it was a risk. They were taking a risk. The point is not to denigrate them, to understand how complicated that history is. Black people, for the most part, couldn't participate. Native people were killed. We can keep going down the history in terms of the legislation against the Chinese, Japanese internment. It just keeps going. A lot of the stuff we're experiencing today, it ain't new news, it's old news. It's, for me, rooted in our lack of reconciliation around those differences. And, how, and it's just exploded in all different kinds of ways. And it gets embedded, even in the way we understand data and what data we think is important and what data we can't see, and who's in the room, and who's making the policy, and who's making the curriculum. And again, it's not about good people versus bad people. It's about all of us living in the country that's complicated, and this stuff is not easy to talk about, right? So how do we hold that? I'm starting to sweat, man. It's like working up. <laughs> OK. Bam. Oh, I put this convergence, because it's all converging. That's just fancy. Boom. All right. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. I know. See, I'm so, I just don't behave well. OK, yes. Yeah, 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 of course. And I keep forgetting that. OK, can you hear me? Yes, you can. OK. Um, so um, originally, Whitney Tome was going to be here today. And I wanted to put this slide up, um, since she couldn't be here today, to talk a little bit about some of the data out there around this. And I'll read this out because I realize that um, there's a, I usually don't put a lot of words up there, but I wanted to get it there. So Dr. Dorsita Taylor at the University of Michigan, where I was just this past week, um, and her folks there, they cre created something called Green 2.0. Her team looked at NGOs, um, NGO foundations and government agencies, something like 171 nonprofits, 74 government agencies, 28 leading grant-making foundations to really see in terms of staff and leadership in terms of diversity, who are we seeing there? And these are some of the colors, quote, or some of the thing, data they came up with, quote, people of color are 36% of the US population and comprise 29% of the science and engineering workforce, but they do not exceed 16% of the staff in any of the organizations surveyed. While organizations have been talking about diversity for decades, the numbers don't lie. Diversity composition has not broken that 16% ceiling. Quote, none of the largest budget organizations had a president, vice president, or assistant associate director who was a person of color. And here's the, so we, and a lot of us already know that data, but here's the piece that actually got me. She said, they said, while many organizations believe that they should support what the study called external talent delivery initiatives, that number drops 20 to 30 percent when asked if they would likely support these initiatives. That's the piece we don't talk about. That's the very human place, the consciousness shift. Because even though they see the data, they're not convinced to support the data. And that's why I always want to ask, and why is that? What's going on? Bias, fear, privilege, all that stuff that really doesn't it doesn't, it's hard to quantify, it's, and it's hard to qualify, but exists there. So how do we engage that? The other thing that I want to say about this, too, is that we are, never forget we're talking about individuals. You know, oftentimes the approach, and I guess I understand this from an organizational or an institutional perspective, is we have to come up with a policy for the institution or the organization. But people can hide behind that policy really easily. Right? Um, I have my own personal story. If there's time, I would tell you, being in a department that recruited me as the only African American in the Department of 75, Environmental Science Policy and Management. And it was nasty, right? It was nasty. They had a $16 million endowment to do diversity and inclusion work at UC Berkeley in the College of Natural Resources. I brought in more African American doctoral students than anyone in the history of the department. I created classes around it. People, they were overloaded. But the fight over my tenure went on for almost three years. It was public. Students protested. People wrote in from around the country. It was brutal and dirty, and I didn't get tenure, all because of the book, nothing else. They couldn't come up with anything else. They didn't think it was long enough. I was told that I didn't have enough pages. But the fight was nasty, and it actually revealed for me 
a lot of what I need to be true. Because diversity is not assimilation. Oh, well, we'll come back to that. Man, I totally went off the thing. I went off the rails there, but we're coming back. Okay, so um, I, want, I wrote here, because I, I want to read this. It's a, a short letter I got by email. Um, part of the challenge is never to forget we're talking about individuals and the impact it is it has on people. So I served on the National Parks Advisory Board for eight years, which was really amazing. And, um, and we all actively walked away last January because we were getting no traction. We couldn't even meet with anybody um, with this administration. And this is from two, um, the letter I got says, we are two young women of color currently employed with the National Park Service. We recently read about your resignation from the National Park System Advisory Board, and we wanted to let you know that your actions meant something to us. As women of color at this particular park, we feel very isolated and oftentimes unheard and under, unrepresented. There are no people of color supervisors above us that want to take action towards making a change in the lack of diversity in the workplace or in our visitation. It can feel very de demotivating when we feel like the only one, the only two that want to work towards change. We run the social media accounts for our park, which holds a lot of promise for forwarding the mission of the National Park Service and attracting a more diverse generation of park stewards. From our position, we feel that there is not much that we can do to subvert the system except in little ways through our interpretive outreach by featuring marginalized faces on our social media feed. We embarked on this career path out of college because we wanted work. We wanted to work towards making public lands more inclusive and protecting the environment. Unfortunately, it was a rude awakening to enter the agency and realize that it is very antiquated, uh, a very antiquated homogenous entity. Not to mention, we have personally been affected by the current administration's views on climate science, and our jobs have become less fulfilling, more surveilled, and ethically questionable. So you think about all the things that they're holding to be at their job, all the things that many people are holding, and some of the things that other people, because of their privilege, don't have to hold at all, but they have to hold it every day. And how do they do that? Oh, just you wonder why that thing looked familiar. That's what I was supposed to have up there at that moment. Boom. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about history, and this uh, is sort of one of the chapters of my book, some stories here. Um, it seems like a story you're kind of, you may be wondering, like, this doesn't make any, what does this got to do with anything? And the issue of representation and who we see and what stories we see. So this uh, cover of Vogue, I believe, is 2008, 2009, the first time they put a, a black man on the cover of Vogue. And so they put on LeBron James and the supermodel Giselle Bündchen. And when this came out, a lot of black people online were pissed. Because they said, you finally put a black man on the cover, and why is he looking all primitive like that? Why couldn't he be looking more elegant, right? And then somebody uncovered that poster, which is from 1917, right? Right down to the color of her dress. Now, the editors of Vogue said they didn't know anything about that over there, which I don't really believe. Um, but here's what I know to be true, whether they knew it or not consciously, that historically, black and brown people have always had a negative association, or were given that negative association, with all things non-human in terms of nature and thinking about land and thinking about the primitive. When I think about the world's fairs that we had to share information, how we're going to become a better country in the late 1800s, if you went to those world fairs and you were white, it must have been pretty amazing because we're thinking about innovation and ideas. And at that time, they might not have called it data, but we're sharing information about how we can be innovative and different and move. You know, in many ways, to be closer to God, as they were thinking. If you were a black and brown person, you were put on display as a thing that we want to move away from. I thought about Otabanga, 19, African, discovered, brought back to the United States, put on display at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City as the missing link. And because they didn't think enough of the public could see him, they moved him to the Bronx Zoo, in, to the primate exhibit until enough people protested. Unfortunately, there's tons and tons of stories. So we jump ahead now, let's say, to our first self-identified African-American president, and suddenly you have Glenn Beck, a, a political conservative talk show host, calling it Obama's Planet of the Apes. You have a woman who runs a nonprofit in West Virginia talking about Michelle Obama as an ape in heels. You have Sean Delonis, a cartoonist for the New York Post. When the stimulus bill comes out, he does a big cartoon. It's of a dead chimpanzee, a sign that's a stimulus bill pinned to his chest, two white cops with smoking guns standing over him. And it goes on and on. These are not outliers. They're not unconnected. It's rooted in something. 
at the consciousness level, right? It's not so much the intellectual level as, as it is the consciousness level about how we think about people, in this case race, who are different than us. And the privilege to be able to either ignore it, erase it, or actually draw, this is what a stereotype often is, right? How it's often grounded there. And we may not even know that this is in our consciousness that's sort of back there operating in very particular ways because our bias may not allow us to see that. How do we hold that? Oh, the other thing that I want to say is that we're so complicated. So in 1964, we had the Civil Rights Act, which was really amazing because across the board, hopefully, equality for all kinds of people, for gender, in terms of race, all of it, we were trying to cover it. The same year we had the Wilderness Act, the same year, these two groups of people weren't talking to each other, in part because they were focused on what they had to do, but if you read the Wilderness Act, it's long, but if you read the Wilderness Act, Howard Zanizer and his people, thoughtful, committed, but they're using all of this universal language about what we all should be doing and how we should be universally, you know, the spiritual connection to the wilderness. This was 1964. I'm sorry. If you didn't look like Howard Zanizer, that was going to be really hard for you to have that kind of experience. And, and, and to drive the point home, a friend of mine sent me an article. It was a white professor who was at Boston College, late 50s, early 60s. He was friends with this African-American couple. They wanted to go to a national park. But he figured we can't do it here in the United States. Let's go over the border to Fundy Bay National Park in Canada. So he wrote the superintendent there. He said, I'm bringing this African-American couple. They're educated. They're nice. You know, can, I would like them to be treated with respect. Uh, he didn't hear anything for a while. And when he did, the superintendent said, I'm really sorry. I cannot make you that promise because we get a lot of American visitors here. The couple was Dr. Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King, who wanted to take a break from their civil rights work in order to have that spiritual renewal in the wilderness that Zanizer and his people were talking about. That's how complicated it is. They couldn't even do it safely. And to, or securely, and to understand that security, this is like a, being at a job when you're the only one in the room. It's not just that you may, I'm not talking about the violence done to you. I'm talking about the lack of capacity of those around you to see who you are, and then support you and give you what is needed in order for you to show up, which means everybody in the room has to change. You can't simply hire somebody who's different. You can't do it. I know, I mean, I've been that person. You cannot do it and think you're going to get something different, right? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm just driving it home. Okay, um, let's move on, Carolyn. One more story. This is a recent one. Just to, uh, again, to sort of drive home the point of individuals. So uh, I got this on my Facebook feed in 2012, and I don't, I still haven't met Vanessa Garrison, but you know how you become friends with people you don't even know. But Vanessa Garrison and Morgan D Dixon founded what's considered the largest nonprofit. They did it in 2012 in the United States for black women in health. And the idea is getting black women in the outdoors, walking, 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 right? And so she sent this out to a bunch of us, and here's what it said. She was at, oh my God, <laughs> she was here in Colorado. Oh, yes, this is the first time I tell this story here. Because I got to read exactly what she wrote. Um, she was at Rocky Mountain National Park, September 5th. When I have a little more time to clear my head, I'm going to write a longer piece about being pulled over in the National Park while I was driving a van full of black women down the mountain after experiencing a magical hike together. I'm going to tell you about the park police officer who approached my van with his hand on his gun and demanded I roll down the back window so he could see who's inside. I'm going to tell you how he accused me of being drunk, asked me what I was doing in the park, and then told me if I cooperated, he wouldn't give me a ticket. A ticket for what, I asked. Driving too close to the car in front of you, that's a crime in Colorado. I led three advanced hikes over the course of three days this last weekend. I've personally brought hundreds of black women to Rocky Mountain National Park over the past four years. I've organized trips at every park in the country, inspired thousands of more to take a step into the great outdoors. I was on the cover of Outside Magazine, started in a Christmas commercial for REI, partnered with the Sierra Club to train outdoor trip leaders, was named a Yosemite National Park ambassador, and yet this man was asking me what I was doing in the park. Asked me while still holding his hand to his gun, despite seeing our hiking gear when we rolled the windows down. Asked me what I was doing there as if he wasn't standing on stolen land, and I was somehow trespassing. This is why I turned down opportunities to speak on diversity and inclusion in the outdoors. Nope, I don't want to be on your panel. No, I don't want to write an article or give a quote. No, I don't believe that things are changing. Diversity and inclusion? How about decolonization and reparations? When you want to talk about that, I'll be ready. In the meantime, we'll be back to the park next year. 
thinking we'll bring a thousand black women this time. Thinking I'll pack a fried chicken sandwich and wrap it in foil and then eat it at the lake next time because I can. Thinking I'll listen to some Tupac while taking in the views. Thinking I'll do whatever I want because I can, because I have a right to be there, because you won't scare us off. I belong here. We belong here. So the other statistic that doesn't come up, she said it, right, is powerful. But this goes on all the time. And it's the thing that doesn't show up in the data, the having to negotiate, the ducking and weaving. You have to think about everything that you say. Can you trust this person? Is my culture going to be seen? Is my experience of the world going to be valued? What do they actually want from me? Why did they hire me in the first place? And oh my god, I just got a diversity fellowship. Does everybody else know that? And then think that I must not be good enough. I only got it because I'm diverse. Like it just goes, it, the emotional and psychic stress that comes and you can't tell people this because you can't trust them because you don't know if they have the capacity to actually hold that for you to know that you're coming in and doing double time all the time and how do we recognize that right it's not about people being special it's just that when you have a history where people have never been fully seen ever legislation doesn't reflect it curriculum doesn't reflect it mission statements don't reflect it it doesn't make people bad but we have to start with that reality that we may have to change it all up and that's right it's going to be hard to do but for me that's where we have to be I'm gonna tell some funny stories now because it's gonna get good soon so how am I doing with time all right so I wanted to, one of the things in talking to black people around the country that came up all the time is memory. And it's really interesting in terms of thinking about memory in terms of data. Because historically for African Americans in this country, when you can't trust institutions, so you, uh, you know things like the Tuskegee experiments, and there's tons of, of examples where governments, agencies, and institutions cannot be trusted, they often rely on their own memory. Um, and so use that oftentimes as a way to kind of collectively do this, in this case, environmental work, but all kinds of work, in terms of how they frame and understand who they are and what they trust, right? But it's also around how people can carry, of all walks of life, in terms of their own diversity, carry around that, carry it around even if they're not thinking about it in their own consciousness. And the story I often tell is in 2005 that I was living in Atlanta doing this work, and I got my parents, Henry and Rose, to come visit me. And I decided we're going to have like the black experience and we're going to go to Martin Luther King National Historic Site and people live on the street and Ebony's Baptist Church is on the street and Dr. King's house he grew up in is on the street and there's a visitor center. We're going to have like the whole thing. My father is old school, old school, old school. Like he doesn't show any vulnerability. He still scares me no matter how old I get dude, you know, his full name is Henry Lee Finney, and I tell people he hated the middle name Lee, he was sure it was after Robert E. Lee, and around 2000, he said, tell me how I can change my name. We told him the paperwork he needed to do. He is now Henry X. Finney. He's a scary dude. Um, so when we walk in, my mother kind of wanders off, and when you walk into the visitor center, there's all this, uh, there's sounds coming over the speaker of Dr. King's voice and police rioting. There's all this imagery everywhere. There's life-size statues of people marching. There's all this stuff going on. So you're having a full sensory experience, a sensory overload. And I'm standing with my dad in front of one of these pictures, and I've told this story many, many times because it still kind of moves me, and my dad suddenly grabs my arm. Now, you know, I'm groaning and stuff. And I'm just like, he, I was like, what's happening there? And I turned and looked at him, and he completely blanched. So what I thought was happening was that he was having a heart attack. And I got scared. And then a couple of seconds after that, he giggled. If you know Henry Lee Finney, that's just really weird. And then he pointed. And what he pointed to was a picture. And it was an image of a sign. And the sign said, for whites only. He said, I saw that sign, and for a minute, I thought we weren't supposed to be here. His memory had taken him back 40 years that fast, and he couldn't do the thing that he'd been doing for 40 years, which is keep that vulnerability hidden. I'm the man. I, got, you know, I can protect. It, it all went away. And so grabbing my arm was to get me out. He couldn't, and that's why, and then he left. So I understood the whole thing, and I was so deeply moved because it was at that moment I understood the vulnerability he had been carrying around his entire life. So when I look at the issue of diversity broadly in this country, what are people carrying around every day? Because we have never fully reconciled how we've treated each other around this stuff and the tension that's there. 
And how do we all stand with that? Not just the people who carry that difference around, but how do we all stand with that and hold that? Oh, yeah, I told you a funny story. Okay, it's coming. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this, but you can ask me our representation in Outside Magazine. Ooh, I'll come back. Mavine is so fabulous, but I'm not familiar. Okay, no, I'm not going to tell that either. Oh, it's such a good story. You all know the beach lady? Nobody knows. You know the beach lady, beach lady. Um, one of the things I want to say in terms of how people, sort of uh, citizens, take their own data and do the work that they do regardless, and in this case, they always pull race into the stories. I always like to tell the story of Mavine Betch. Um, people haven't heard of Mavine Betch, but Jonetta Cole was her sister and is a well-known um, African-American academic. Uh, they grew up on Amelia Island off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida um, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. They came from a very wealthy black family. So they had the money. Um, her her great-grandfather, A.L. Lewis, was the first man black or white to have a life insurance company um, in Jacksonville. But they were black in the 40s. It didn't matter how much money you had. You couldn't go to the same beach as white people. So they decided to buy a beach. So they bought a beach on Amelia Island. They called it American Beach. And you could be a janitor and have a house. You could be a lawyer or government official. You could have a modest home on the beach. And so here's, that's what Mavine, the atmosphere she grew up in. She went to Oberlin College. She decided she wanted to be an opera singer. She went to Germany for a number of years, was fairly, you know, did fairly well, and then decided she became interested in environmental causes. When she came back to the United States, she gave all her wealth away to environmental causes, all of it, over $750,000. The great, her house that had been bequeathed to her by her great-grandfather was given away to environmental causes, right? Um, I asked her where, where she was living on. She was living on a chaise lounge on the beach. And I would always ask her, I was like, weren't you scared and stuff? She said, no, I had a big stick. <laughs> then her sister got her a trailer. She moved into that. And the fight was for Amelia Island. I mean, for, was, was for American Beach. Because on Amelia Island, you had two, it was surrounded by two beach resorts on either side. Prime beachfront property, sand dunes, maritime forest, the whole nine yards. Developers wanted to build another hotel, a golf course, or whatever it is they wanted to do. And she was going to fight it. But the thing about the way that Mavine would fight that was by understanding that it's also about the African-American story in the place. It isn't only about the maritime forest. And so she did a really good job of telling the story in that way, talking about what she saw as the experience collectively of black people, and understanding that if we're going to talk about the maritime forest, we have to talk about that too, right? And how do we hold that? Because, you know, it wasn't in, you know, there's been books written about her. There's a film been written about her. I go all around the country doing this particularly with environmental organizations who've never heard of her. So the question for me is, why is that? Um, the story of John Francis is the same. Have you all, John Francis? A couple of more people have heard of John. John be amazing, and look how handsome he is. Um, I love me some John Francis. Um, who are we seeing? Who is being represented? Who's not being represented? John lived in the 70s in Northern California. There was a small oil spill. He got real upset by that, so he wasn't taking any motor tr motorized transport. He was just walking around. He said after about a week, he was always getting in arguments with everybody because they wanted him to just get in the car, or, you know, do whatever, stop whatever he was doing, and he wouldn't do that, so he decided to stop talking about it. John spent 22 years walking across the United States and Latin America to raise environmental awareness, and he did it for 17 years without talking. He got his doctorate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison without talking. So, 89, 90, Exxon Valdez happened. He was talking, but still only walking and riding his bike. Exxon, when Exxon Valdez happened, he was the only PhD in the country who'd done a PhD on oil spills. So he got a call from some folks in Washington, said, we want you to interview for this job. We got to create a policy. We'll fly you down. He wouldn't fly down. We'll give you a train to, I won't take the train. How will you get here? I'll ride my bike. How long is that going to take? A month. They waited. He rode his bike. He interviewed. He got the job. He's one of our early architects of our early oil spill policy. Um, he decided that he wanted to write a book about his experience called Planet Walker in the early 2000s. Dude couldn't find anybody to publish the story because we got so many stories about black men spending 22 years walking across the country to raise environmental awareness, 17 years without talking. So he self-publishes it. I want to say that National Geographic came around. Uh, there's a backstory that I'm just leaving out for the moment and decided that they would republish it, and now he's a National Geographic fellow. Uh, Hollywood bought the rights to the film. I got real excited. For a while, it was Will Smith. Now I'm thinking, man, Idris Elba would be awesome. <laughs> anyway, um, I got sidetracked there. Uh, anyway, <laughs> often when I tell the audience that, audiences will say, well, Hollywood's going to mess it up. And I said, actually, I don't care who makes the film. 
Because when is the last time you've seen a story about a black man who spent 22 years walking across the United States to raise awareness 17 years without talking? It doesn't matter who tells the story. We'll see someone who looks like him on the screen. People will be in the audience. It'll be out from the shadows. The story is going to be up front. He will be represented. He's done TED Talks, all kinds of things. I still go in rooms. For the most part, most of the room has never heard of him. Again, I have to ask the question, what stories are we telling? What data are we collecting in terms of who cares and does what it is they do? I want to tell this one more story. Oh, and then we can have a conversation because we're going to have some time. Well, I'm going to come back to that. Everybody's getting scared now. Let's go back. So um, the last story that I want to tell here is about Brenda Palms Barber because I want to talk about, yeah, I'm going to tell you a story a little bit. So Brenda, this was maybe 15 years ago. She was from Colorado. Oh, my God, this is it's so funny to me when I realized that. Can I tell this story? I'm like, yeah, she was from here. She got a call from some folks in Chicago who said, we have a lot of previously incarcerated black men and women, come out of jail, can't get a job, could you come here and help us think about what they can do? And she said, sure, I want to be, get to know the community, so I'll move there. She did. Uh, she talked to community folks, they thought about landscape gardening, they thought about driving around the elderly, decent ideas, um, but none she felt had, had long you know, legs right into the future. Then she was having a random conversation with people about beekeeping. Just, random with a friend, and she, the minute the person said beekeeping, she said she was like, oh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to make urban honey on the west side of Chicago. And you know, people thought she was crazy. But she made her company Sweet Beginnings, honey and honey related products. It's incredibly successful. The reason I like to tell you her story is because when, I want to tell you what she does when she interviews some of these young black men and women for a job. So she'll go up to, you know, I come off the stage, but don't, I can't. Um, uh, she'll go up to one of these young men or women and say, so you're looking for a job? And they'll say, yes. And she says, so you were in jail? And they'll say, yeah. And she'll say, so what were you in jail for? And they might say, well, for selling drugs. And then she kind of looks at them. She said, I, I do a dramatic pause. Were you good at it? <laughs> and usually they'll say, yeah, until I got caught. <laughs> well, what were you good at? Well, I understood the quality of my product. I understood the value of my customer base. And everything they rattled off, she'd just be like, that's all transferable over here, this legal thing that we're going to do. And the point for me is, and I tell people, for me, the term outreach is outdated. Because uh, she wasn't doing outreach. She recognized that that individual comes fully formed with ideas. It didn't matter. It, it mattered that they were in jail, just in terms of how that informed the way they think about themselves in the world. They have something that she doesn't have. The possibility and the potential for where they might go is in part embedded in that person's experience. It's not about outreaching, because here's what outreach means to be. I'm, I've been outreached to, and I know it's well-intentioned. Outreach is like I get to reach over to one of you. If, if I could come off the stage, I could take your hand. I'd be like, how you doing? You tell me your name. I bring you over to my, oh, this is my table right here. I bring you over to my table. I squeeze in a chair for you at my table. Squeeze in. And then you have to learn everything about everyone around the table, about the culture of the table. You have to learn about the table. You have to learn about the language of the table. You have to learn about the mission statement of the table. And we don't have to know anything about you. Right? And for me, there is nothing sustainable about that. It is about a relationship of reciprocity, which means we may potentially have to throw out the table or the configuration of the table. Or we may have to decide the leadership model as we set it up doesn't work. This is one of the reasons people resist it so bad. And the human side of me you know, understands the resistance. But really, if you're telling me that you want something different around diversity, you have to actually do something different. This isn't about being comfortable. Understanding it's not about being comfortable. So many of us have never been comfortable. It's hard to be co comfortable when your story isn't reflected in the data that's being used to make policy and curriculum, right? It's not about being comfortable. Um, a couple of years ago on NPR on Michelle Martin's show, she had Svetlana Alasievich on there, who just won a Nobel Prize for her work on Belarus and Chernobyl. And a lot of her people from her country were pissed at her for saying this stuff out loud. Her government was pissed. And Michelle was saying, you know, they're mad at you for saying this stuff. And basically Svetlana Alasievich said, you know, I love my country, but I'm not interested in it being comfortable. I'm interested in it being better. So what are we willing and to do to get there? So I, because I want to have time for us to talk, I'm going to put this. That's just a lovely picture of emergence. We can talk about that. <sighs> but what I want to do is I'm going to leave it on this. 
because we didn't have, this is what I hope that we can kind of get at. And um, I always end with these two quotes just because I like them. Albert Einstein, who said, um, you can't solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. Albert Einstein, smart. I love myself. Albert. You can't solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. This isn't simply about coming up with a series of steps. I sort of wanted to push back on something that I heard earlier in a good way, that um, actually, we are, forgive me for this and we can have a conversation. You can't, this isn't a problem to solve. This is a process. Change is ongoing. So we have to build our practice and our skill set to engage it better. You will never solve the problem. Diversity isn't a problem. It's who we are as human beings. So how do we show up to that in a better way and engage that with less fear? So even though Albert Einstein says you can't solve a problem with the same conscience that created, he was smart. Ooh, that's so deep. I like the way the comedian moms maybe said it better. If you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. Your turn. Thank you. <laughs>